Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. My name is Andrew Escobar. I am the son of a respiratory therapist, an asthmatic, and the vice president of business development for National PFT. I'd like to thank the COPD Foundation for asking me to speak today about the importance of spirometry in primary care. I'd like to start with a simple question, one asked by Dr. Gene Wright, the CEO of the COPD Foundation. How long do you think the gap is between the first serious symptoms of COPD and the moment it's actually diagnosed? Take a second and think about your own patients. I encourage you to write this number down. Please don't overthink it. Just write the number that feels correct to you. Because by the end of this talk, I think that number will stick with you. And now, why does this matter? Because what we're really talking about today is the power of early identification through measurement. Because we cannot manage what we do not measure. And right now, millions of Americans with asthma, COPD, and other lung diseases are undiagnosed, overdiagnosed, and being managed without ever having confirmatory lung function measurements. That's where spirometry comes in. It's how we detect airflow limitation to classify if it is an obstructive or restrictive disease. So please hold on to that number you wrote down. We'll come back to it soon. And when you hear the answer, I think you'll understand why early testing changes everything. As I previously stated, millions of Americans with COPD or other lung diseases are being managed without ever having their lung function measured. That's a problem. Because early identification via diagnostic testing, not simply a questionnaire or from symptoms, is where we make the biggest difference. The earlier we identify at-risk patients like smokers, vapors, those with occupational exposures, and those with family history of alpha-1, the more time we have to slow progression, prevent flare-ups, and keep people out of the hospital. And because of that, spirometry is the foundation. It's the only way to confirm obstructive or restrictive airflow. Without it, we're simply guessing. And We guess wrong a lot. Now, let's go back to that number you wrote down. The answer is seven to 10 years. That's right. The gap between the first serious symptoms of COPD and the actual diagnosis is seven to 10 years, sometimes decades. Seven to 10 years, that patient's going untreated, undiagnosed, or misdiagnosed. And that's what we're here to change because undiagnosed COPD is expensive for patients, providers, and payers. COPD alone costs the U.S. healthcare system over $50 billion a year. Asthma adds another $80 billion yearly. Most of that spending comes from exacerbations and hospitalizations, events we could often prevent with earlier diagnosis and treatment. When lung disease goes undiagnosed or misdiagnosed, the financial toll is massive. In one managed care analysis, patients with undiagnosed COPD had over $1,100 in extra costs per person during the two years before formal diagnosis, and nearly $2,500 in the final year before diagnosis, mostly from hospitalizations. Misdiagnosed patients carry the burden of financial waste, the cost of treatments that do not help, and the cost of delayed interventions that could have. Undiagnosed or misdiagnosed lung disease shifts spending upstream towards emergency rooms, inpatient care, and wasted therapies. Early, accurate diagnosis isn't just better medicine, it's healthier for the patients and fiscally responsible for health care as a whole. Now, let's talk about why spirometry is still underused in primary care. It's not because clinicians do not know its value. I believe it's because of workflow. I understand and appreciate that your individual workflow is sacred ground. It's something you've spent your entire career shaping into what works for you. Busy clinics, short visits, 
and staff turnover make it hard to maintain confidence in producing quality tests. Because of this, many clinicians label patients with COPD or asthma based only on symptoms without spirometry, and the data shows it. That's why the HEDIS measure for spirometry use was created in the first place, to highlight that gap. For 18 years, HEDIS assessed adults 40 years of age and older who have a new diagnosis of COPD or newly active COPD who receive spirometry testing to confirm that diagnosis. And in that 18 years, the average across all payers was 34%. This means that 66% of COPD patients were diagnosed without testing. In 2024, he just retired this measure because, I quote, this measure is not widely used and addresses only one aspect of COPD care, the confirmation of a new diagnosis. So when we do not measure, we misclassify. So how do we fix this? We integrate spirometry into your existing workflows. We start in your electronic health records, use prompts to flag patients who have COPD in their chart but no confirmed spirometry. Next, use case finding tools like the capture questionnaire during intake, rooming, or annual wellness visits. It's quick. Five questions to flag who should receive testing. This keeps the process efficient and lets the front end or triage staff, not the physician, start that conversation. Then, schedule follow-ups automatically when the test is ordered. That simple loop of identify, test, and follow-up is how early detection becomes standard practice. And when we respect the sacred workflow of primary care, these improvements last. As Dr. Milan Hahn, professor of medicine at the University of Michigan, says in her book, Breathing Lessons, A Doctor's Guide to Lung Health, Spirometry is not just a test of lung health, it is a test of human health. It should be considered the fifth vital sign. Think about that. We grew up seeing thermometers, blood pressure cuffs, scales, and stethoscopes as symbols of health. But most Americans have never heard the word spirometer. We already know that 66 out of 100 COPD patients have never seen a spirometer. And considering human's peak lung function naturally starts to decline at 25 years old, why do we wait until Americans are in their 50s, 60s, or 70s, if ever, to perform spirometry? That is too late. By then, disease has already taken root. We should treat the spirometer as essential as a scale or a CBC, something used regularly before it's too late. Now that we have brought spirometry into the clinic, where do we go from here? We apply gold standards for COPD care. We move from guesswork to consistency. Gold is clear. You cannot diagnose COPD without post-bronchodilator spirometry. All management decisions depend on it. Following gold brings structure and reproducibility. Every patient gets the same evidence-based approach. That means less variation, fewer errors, and better outcomes. Consistency also supports benchmarking and value-based care. When practices use the same process, we can track outcomes, refine protocols, and demonstrate measurable improvement. Now let's talk about smoking cessation. One of the most powerful effects of spirometry is behavioral, not just diagnostic. When smokers actually see their numbers, when they blow into the device and watch their FEV1 come back lower than expected, it hits differently. Multiple studies have shown that seeing tangible evidence of lung damage dramatically increases motivation to quit. Spirometry transforms risk into reality. It turns an abstract warning into a personal wake-up call. It's no longer smoking might hurt me someday. It's smoking has already taken a piece of my lung. Smoking has taken a piece of my freedom. Freedom to do whatever it is your patient wanted to do in retirement. 
or even earlier. That moment changes lives. It also strengthens the cessation programs we already have. For instance, for every dollar all U.S. states spend on providing tobacco cessation treatments, there is an average potential return on investment of $1.26. Now, let's pivot to alpha-1 testing, a simple but critical step that belongs in every COPD workup and is critical to the smoker. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a genetic cause of early emphysema and liver disease, often developing decades before typical COPD. Guidelines recommend that every patient with COPD be tested for alpha-1 at least once in their lifetime. This test is simple. It's a free cheek swab kit mailed to the lab. When positive, we confirm with genotype testing, optimize inhalers, vaccination, and lifestyle. And for eligible patients, consider IV augmentation therapy, which can slow lung function decline. We also protect families through cascade testing, so siblings and children can be identified early. One cheek swab can change a life, and sometimes an entire family tree. And that brings me to the business of primary care. So how do spirometry, gold guidelines, smoking cessation, and alpha-1 testing improve your bottom line? Simply put, spirometry and smoking cessation are billable services but a comprehensive spirometry program goes beyond your normal fee-for-service billings. In Medicare Advantage, every coded chronic condition maps to an HCC, which directly increases risk scores and therefore monthly revenues. In ACOs, it's a little bit different. Accurate HCC coding doesn't bring direct payment, but it adjusts your benchmark, the expected cost of care for that year. A higher benchmark gives the ACO more room to generate shared savings when spending comes in below expectations. In both cases, accurate diagnosis makes your financial picture more honest and more sustainable. How many obstructive or restrictive patients are undiagnosed in your Medicare population? Who knows? That accuracy of diagnosis, shared savings, and the sustainability of a successful pulmonary program depends on spirometry. So after all the testing, and we've diagnosed all the patients in your, in your clinic, now comes the education and support. COPD and other lung diseases can be isolating but connection transforms these outcomes. Patients engaged in peer or education programs show better self-management, lowering anxiety, and higher quality of life. Education helps patients recognize warning signs, use inhalers correctly, and stay adherent, which directly reduces exacerbations and hospitalizations. There are fantastic resources to connect your pulmonary population to. First is the COPD Foundation. It's a trusted, patient-centered resource designed to help individuals living with COPD better understand and manage their condition. They offer easy-to-read education on diagnosis, treatment options, inhaler use, and lifestyle changes, along with downloadable tools like the COPD Action Plan and Guides for Better Living which you can provide to them in your clinic. Patients can also connect with others through, through, uh, through the COPD360 social platform, the foundation's online community for sharing experiences, so patients can ask questions and find support. Patients have another resource through the American Lung Association. By calling 1-800-LUNG-USA, patients can speak with lung health experts including registered nurses and respiratory therapists. Breathe Strong is a national AHAC dedicated to improving education, awareness, and community support for people living with COPD and other chronic lung diseases. Uh, Breathe Strong America 
they provide free downloadable COPD guides as well, self-management tools and access to local in-person community workshops and online education. And Right to Breathe offers a free online patient support program, online chat and live video conference with medical experts, each offering free tools, action plans, and community support. You do not have to shoulder the burden of lung disease alone. The education, the pharmacotherapy, the smoking cessation, everything that goes into a successful spirometry program, there are tools and organizations designed to help help you outside the four walls of your clinic. You know, these educational resources and community connections are medicine for the body and the mind. So when we close this loop with early identification via spirometry, the testing portion, the coding, the education, and the follow-up, we achieve true comprehensive proactive pulmonary care. The days of reactive care, they're gone. And spirometry is not just a diagnostic test. It is a time machine. It lets us rewind that clock, find disease years earlier, and give patients back the time they would have lost a decline in hospitalizations. For your patients, it means the correct diagnosis, fewer flare-ups, and better quality of life. For your patients' families, it means fewer ER visits, inpatient stays, and lost days to fill in the blank. For payers and systems, it means lower costs of care and fewer readmissions. And for your office, it means closing care gaps, capturing accurate risk scores, and leading the way in value-based care. So my challenge to you is this. Please make spirometry routine. Please build it into your intake and workflow. If you need to, partner with a mobile testing service. And if you'd like to go it alone and you'd like to learn some more information about the spirometers that are out there, the CPT codes that are billable, and uh, ways to better identify the at-risk populations in your clinics, reach out. I'm available. I would love to talk to you about this. And let's give every patient with cough, wheeze, or shortness of breath, the gold standard start they deserve. When we catch disease early, we don't just improve outcomes, we change futures. Thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day, and let's keep those lungs healthy.